SJC 11833, Commonwealth v. Jason Estabrook, and another. Mr. Murphy. Good morning. May I please the court? My name is George Murphy. I represent Jason Estabrook. I'm here along with in another, as it says on the list, uh, is Adam Bradley, represented by Dan Beck. Uh, I am arguing only on the issue of standing. I believe I have two or three minutes, uh, and Mr. Beck is going to argue uh, the rest. If there's any questions concerning questions other than standing, I would defer those to Mr. Beck most respectfully. So your, your claim on standing is that your client, Mr. Estabrook? Yes, sir has standing to challenge the searches or the seizure of telephone records of yes. the other individuals in this case? As to Mr. Bradley. As to Mr. Bradley's records. As to Mr. Bradley's records yes. only. Yes, Your Honor, most respectfully. And, and why would you have standing in those circumstances? These are not your client's records. The case, if I understand it correctly, uh, Mr. Estabrook's charged with first degree murder. Mm -hmm. uh, this murder happened on July 7th, uh, 2012, up in the town of Bill Ricker. Uh, an investigation uh, pursuant to phone records was conducted by the Mass State Police and Bill Ricker Police. Uh, they received records concerning uh, phone records of an Adam Bradley. They interviewed Adam Bradley on August 2nd, 2012. Uh, he, at that time, had told the police that he was not in possession of that uh, phone on the night of the murder that, that Jason Estabrook had that particular phone on that particular night. Uh, further investigation uh, revealed an individual by the name of Douglas Dillon, uh, who lives in Revere, uh, knows <coughs> both Mr. Bradley and knows uh, Mr. Estabrook. Uh, he was placed before the grand jury on September 12th, 2012, and indicated that in the morning of July 7th, the murder, I believe, it happened approximately 3.50 in the morning. Uh, he received several phone calls shortly after that from Mr. Estabrook, and in those particular phone calls, uh, he indicated that they were from Adam Bradley's phone, but he was talking to Jason Estabrook, and they, Mr. Estabrook was in possession of those particular phones. Uh, so what, what is the principle that you ask us to apply? If somebody uses, a, uses a phone for a day, they have standing? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he was in possession of that uh, phone from the information uh, both before and after. And he had, he had uh, obviously, I suggest the expectation of privacy before and after uh, this particular murder. Uh, no, one, no one has come before, and there's no evidence that was presented at the motion to suppress hearing uh, that uh, Adam Bradley had this phone at any amount of time, but that uh, I'm suggesting there is evidence and I believe that Judge Tupman indicated in her ruling that uh, she felt that he had standing without deciding it. It almost sounds like the flake gate, but uh, that- <laughs> We're not gonna go there. <laughs> that uh, that uh, for purposes of standing, for uh, using that phone before and after the murder that uh, Mr. Estabrook would have standing. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. the court, Dan Beck for Adam Bradley in this case. I suggest that the, it's settled law that the measure of the, one's invasion of reasonable expectation of privacy is the scope of the search. It is not dependent, contrary to what the motion judge ruled, it is not dependent on how much of the uh, item seized or information obtained is used. I think that's clear from the cases cited in my brief. Now let's, let's assume you're right on that. Okay. How does that help you in that I gather that Mr. Bradley had made certain statements that are key here before he was confronted with the CSLI by the police on August 2nd? Well, most of the statements he made were made after, frankly. There were a few that were made before but the vast majority of statements he made were after, between the two interviews, the one on August 2nd and the one on September 28th. Well, let's assume, um, so it's, it's, well, let's assume you're right on that first question. Okay. What, turning to the search warrant that was ultimately obtained in November, 
Um, is Judge Tutman wrong that she is permitted uh, to excise the portions of it that relate to the CSLI and see whether there is probable cause, sufficient information in the affidavit? Well, first of all, I would suggest that she has to excise more than what is directly related to the CSLI. That is, the CSLI information came very early in the uh, investigation, and I think it tainted much of what was done afterwards. That is, the police were relying heavily on the CSLI uh, throughout the entire investigation. I also point out that... But what, a, what did the CS... As far as I can tell, the CSLI was not very precise and didn't even put him in Bill Ricca, put him somewhere in the Burlington Bedford area. But still, it would contradict enough. his statements that he was, not, he was in uh, Lynn or Revere at the time. So it would be very, uh, certainly would be very important. But, uh, but didn't she find that, that much of the stuff in that affidavit really was unconnected to the CSLI? She did, but I'm not sure that I agree with those Findings. It also wouldn't affect the uh, admissibility of his statements, considering it occurred many, many months after he made the statements. The, the obtaining of the warrant was some 17 months later. So it certainly doesn't affect the admissibility of his statements. But I'd suggest that the... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really just talking about the CSL, using the CSLI itself. I would suggest, first of all, that the CSLI is what told them that they should uh, give Ashley Marshall immunity. That is, the CSLI showed that she was not in the area, even though she was as connected telephonically to uh, the uh, rest of the uh, but, but, uh, but do you have standing to raise that? Well, I suggest that Mr. Bradley, for instance, could easily have been given immunity um, had they not had the CSLI. I mean, that's... Kind of what I'm saying is that the, the, the investigation would have been different, different people would have been immunized. That seems quite a broad sweep. Well, I suggest that when the CSL, when the illegally obtained information is obtained this early in the case, it's very difficult to separate out what is related to it and what is not. And well, I'm, 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 well, I mean, are you claiming that you're entitled to argue for all the CSLI, including persons other than Mr. Bradley's phone? No. Okay, so all of that, right or wrong, you can't complain about. Correct. Uh, and your client, I gather, said first that he threw the phone in the reservoir. Yes. And that he and that he didn't even have the phone. He gave it to Mr. Estabrook. Correct. So how does the CSLI for that phone then be viewed as being connected to admissions made by your client? Well, I think the Commonwealth's position is that the uh, phone was used by Mr. Bradley, and that's the evidence that they will induce at trial, that the phone was used by Mr. Bradley. That there was uh, no handoff to Estabrook. Right. So that I suggest that, well, that's a question of fact, obviously, for the jury to determine. Um, it's, not, it's not accepted. It's not given. It's not settled that Mr. Uh, Estabrook had the phone. Okay, I, I understand that, but aren't you arguing with regard to the attenuation doctrine, that there has to be some causal connection between the use of the CSLI and your client's statement? Yes, and, and they and, said, and, and how we do you know get you were in Bill Ricca area at the time, uh, numerous times in his interview. Um, and I suggest that that provoked statements that could be seen with the CSLI to be untrue, but those are essentially admissions um, and that they're something that the Commonwealth would use against him. Um, that I think under you know, Porter P, um, and um, question, the question is whether the uh, illegally obtained information was used to obtain the statement. And I think in this case, as the judge found, uh, the motion judge found that it was. And I suggest that that finding was correct. Now, l let me ask you another question, which I'm not sure is directly raised here. Uh, Let's assume for the sake of argument that you prevail in claiming that the CSLI as used here was uh, illegal and therefore could not have been used or could not, it, it may, may arguably taint both the admission and the search. Is there anything that would keep the Commonwealth at trial from, from applying for a search warrant for that same CSLI? Uh, 
and using it at trial. No, but well, I suggest that did. any search warrant they would apply for now would contain no more information than the search warrant that was eventually obtained, that it would essentially be a duplicate search warrant, that they really have adduced no additional evidence uh, but, to speak of since then. But, well, I'm sorry. No, I, I, mean, I was just asking a question that follows up on that. So I'm, I'm just trying to get your, going back to your position on the search warrant that was obtained. You say, um, just in terms of the CSLI itself, it can't be used because Judge Tutman was incorrect in saying that there was this discernible part that one could sever and still find probable cause. That, I, that, the, C, that the CSLI infected everything in the warrant. Is that your well, position? I don't know about everything, but certainly much more than uh, Judge Tutman uh, said than Judge Tubman found. I suggest that a lot of the information, I said when the search warrant is, is issued some 17 months after the illegal obtained evidence, it becomes really hard to pick out what is ind actually independent and what is not. So I suggest that, that, and that brings up the issue of the standard of proof. I'm asking this court to adopt a clear and convincing evidence as New Jersey has, um, which would bring it into line with the, uh, um, where somebody, uh, the identification issues, where if there's a misidentification, the Commonwealth has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that there was an independent source. I suggest that this is analogous to that and that it should be clear and convincing evidence that um, the, uh, evidence was obtained completely independently, wholly independently, as the case plus says, from the uh, illegally obtained information. Can I ask you a question about uh, going under Augustine? Um, if the Commonwealth had sought only the six hours nearest the time of the killing, uh, would you say that would be permissible under Augustine? Yes. Um, and what do you say about the argument that just as in reviewing a search warrant, you can sever the parts of it that are overbroad and look to see what is not, that that should be applied to the analysis of whether or not. Because the two situations are not analogous in that one is discussing probable cause. That is, the typical uh, severance is where there's probable cause for certain uh, items and not probable cause for others. That's a very different situation. So you're saying there wouldn't have been probable cause for the six hours worth? No. I'm saying that under Augustine, it comes under the exception where probable cause is not necessary. But the question is the reason probable cause is not necessary under Augustine for six hours is that it is not uh, a, an invasion of one's reasonable expectation of privacy, which I suggest in this case, it's the extent of the search that determines whether it's... Uh, the 14 days. Yes, that determines it. I think the Commonwealth's brief argues pretty persuasively under citing uh, U.S. v. Jones and U.S. v. Maynard, that is the length of the surveillance in those cases that determines the extent of the uh, invasion of one's reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and I think it's completely artificial to say what you use as I pointed out in my reply brief, if somebody's <coughs> house is searched from stem to stern and little, little or nothing is found, that doesn't mean that there's no invasion of the reasonable expectation of privacy, justifiably or otherwise. Um, but this extent of a search that determines the uh, invasion of one's reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's the difference. You, don't, you can't sever a reasonable expectation of privacy the way you can probable cause or no probable cause. I suggest that they're completely separate concepts. If there are no other questions, then I will oh. sit down. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Counselor. I'm sorry, I do have one. I just, I wanna, I want to just be clear because I'm not exactly how many if you could just list the challenges that you're raising. I, I understand the challenge to the, to the determination that as long as only six hours are used, that's okay. Um, I understand the challenge, I, I think you've explained that you are challenging the validity of the whole search warrant because actually the CSLI 
illegally obtained, tainted everything in there, that you say that. Right. You say the um, CSLI uh, wrongly obtained taints the whole um, uh, uh, interrogation of right. your client, and so that needs to go out. Um, is there anything else that you're- Attenuation. The judge found that even if uh, the uh, evidence was illegally obtained, attenuation applies. And I suggest that attenuation, the difference between attenuation after an illegal search and an illegal arrest is vastly different. That is, uh, Sorry. Attenu the question in an illegal search is not the length of time, but whether the evidence was used directly to obtain the statement. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Jamie Michael Charles from Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. With me is David Solid, who is the trial ADA in this matter. I'd like to start by addressing uh, Defendant Estabrook's standing argument. Um, as this court is aware, in Massachusetts, principles of standing still apply and are separate from the issue of whether an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, the defendant must show that he has a substantial possessory interest in the phone or to by extension to the records, the CSLI records, in order to have standing in this matter. Well, how are we supposed to, to deal with this? The judge didn't make any findings <clears throat> well, that would, would support your argument. We don't know whether he possessed it at the times that he said he did or well, he Well, this didn't. court can conduct an analysis based on the evidence that was introduced at the motion hearing and what is apparent we, on the record. We, sh that we should make the finding? The defendant has the burden to establish standing. I, I if there is insufficient that. evidence in the record. But if the judge didn't make a finding, how are we supposed to? The judge well, she essentially it. decided he, he she, she found that he had standing, although she did not, she assumed he had standing. So mm -hmm. while she did not conduct a detailed analysis that outlined the reasoning underlying that assumption, she still, in all, for all intents and purposes, has concluded that I'm going to proceed on this analysis as though he has standing. So isn't that what we need to do? I don't believe this court needs to do that. I believe well, then this court can say- But how do we find as a fact that he didn't? I think this court can look to the evidence. There was a significant amount of evidence introduced, exhibits and otherwise, and testimony at the- But she heard a lot of testimony also. Correct. Wasn't there evidence that um, from another witness uh, that had, he had received a call from? That evidence is not part of the record. Wait a second, that wasn't before judge the, the judge? No, no it was not. There was no testimony from any of the Commonwealth's witnesses, nor was the grand, if you look at the exhibit list, nor was the grand jury testimony of Douglas Dillon introduced into evidence. There was grand jury testimony of Ashley Marshall, there was grand jury testimony of police officers introduced into evidence. The defendant did not introduce Mr. Dillon's grand jury testimony into the record. And if it is not in the record, as this court is often fond of telling uh, litigants before it, it is not to be considered by this court. So there is no evidence that Douglas Dillon received any calls from a phone belonging to Bradley from Jason Estabrook. The only evidence in the record is Adam Bradley's equivocal and self-serving statements during a police interview that Estabrook may have had his phone. I will note that if you read this interview closely, and that's why the Commonwealth put it in its record appendix, Mr. Bradley never at any point says, I'm telling you, Estabrook had my phone on the night of July 7th. He says, they say, who might have had your phone? He says, oh, I don't know, maybe Jason Estabrook or this guy just in case. And then he says later, well, you know what, actually I did have my phone, or you know what, I didn't have it, but maybe Jason had it. So he's never, he's never definitively stated that Mr. Estabrook has the phone. In addition, he's confronted with facts, most uh, saliently, the fact that there are numerous calls placed to his girlfriend that night around the time of the murder, and he tells the investigators, no, Mr. Estabrook would have no reason to call my girlfriend. Why would he do that? So that also suggests that he is lying. Not to mention, his statements are directly contradicted by the defendant, Estabrook himself. When he is first interviewed by police, he explicitly tells them, I don't own a phone. I don't use Bradley's phone. I don't even know the password to Bradley's phone. Is that in the record? That is in the, uh, the Commonwealth. It was introduced at the hearing, and the Commonwealth, included it in its supplemental record appendix. 
He subsequently <coughs> reneges a little bit and says, okay, I have used Bradley's phone, but I only use it when I'm spending the night at his house to send some text messages to friends. And even then, I don't know the password. He unlocks it for me and I send some messages. So this defendant has himself disclaimed any possessory interest in the phone. He's saying, I don't possess this phone. I've never possessed this phone other than in very isolated situations. So he is directly contradicting what Bradley says. And Bradley's statements, self-serving and equivocal, are the only evidence on this record that in any way suggests Esterbrook may have possessed this phone so, so on the night. So what is the standard? I mean, we have many times in which phones are in the name of a parent or of a girlfriend. What is the standard by which one has standing for the use of a phone? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest, although I ad admit there are not, there's not a voluminous uh, amount of case law on the issue, I would submit that arguably if the defendant can establish that he did possess the phone for that during day? the relevant time period, he would have standing. Does that possess means use? I think I will. I think in the context of CSLI, where we're talking about the possession and the tracking of movements, you could there could be an argument that just possessing it for that time period would be sufficient. But the defendant still has the burden of establishing that. Okay, but is that the same thing as using, possessing? I mean, if I take my friend's cell phone. I'm, I'm and not conceding I'm that. I think possessing is different from using. I'm not conceding that mere possession would be enough, but I could see that there could be an argument where you're talking about CSLI. But again, here, there really is no. So let me just ask you do you intend, does the Commonwealth intend to use this, the uh, CSLI information obtained from Bradley's phone as against Estabrook? Only to the extent that the Commonwealth is alleging this is a joint venture and that all of the parties were in the area at the relevant time. Uh, the Commonwealth now has voluminous other evidence that puts the defendant, uh, he was, he Which acknowledged wearing- Which defendant are you talking about? Estabrook, Estabrook, I'm sorry. He acknowledges wearing Douglas Dillon's hat and his DNA was found in the hat on the scene. Uh, he, the Commonwealth has surveillance footage of uh, Estabrook arriving at Salem Hospital, wearing uh, so clothing yes, similar yes, yes to- Yes or no as to whether or not the CSL- No, we will not be direct, we'll be using it to the extent that we're suggesting Bradley is there and that he was operating in concert with Bradley. The Commonwealth will not be using Estabrook's CSLI to say Estabrook, or Bradley's CSLI to say Estabrook was there, because the Commonwealth's position is Bradley had the phone. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to the Commonwealth's argument with regards to an independent source, the search warrant that was issued. Are you going to address you your argument? Six hours? Yeah. Why don't you first say, how do, we, how, do we, how do we do that? Do you get to choose which six hours? No. Uh, I would but just you like, do this for three years and just say, oh, all we well, want is those six hours? To, to, be, to be clear, the, this is not a prospective argument. The Commonwealth does not dispute, and I believe uh, <coughs> we noted in, I believe it was footnote, uh, I, I, in a footnote in my brief, we, we note, going forward, post-Augustine, it is without question for the period of time that this court ultimately determines a warrant is required, whatever that ultimately that ultimate minimum period is, the Commonwealth must get a warrant to obtain CSLI information. We could not, in the future, request a year of CSLI and then say, oh, it turns out we only need this one week or we only need these 48 hours. That's not something that can happen, and we're not suggesting it does in our brief. This is a retrospective case where two years ago, relying on a lawful statute, and, on, and applying a standard that neither this court nor the United States Supreme Court had called into question. That's a different argument. That's an argument about why the, why the um, uh, exclusionary rule should apply. I agree. Apply. That's but, not, what I'm trying that's to not the argument is you made. The defendant's suggestions that we're going to go on future fishing expeditions are not warranted. I am not arguing here, nor did the Commonwealth argue in its brief, that going forward we should be able to pick and choose. I'm not arguing. Why should your client be treated any differently than Augustine himself? It our went client? back. I'm sorry, why should uh, the defendants in this case? I can give you a very simple answer to that question. In Augustine, there was I'm no- I'm sure you can. There was no, no one knew when the victim died in Augustine. But that, the vi in, in Augustine, the victim disappears. So why didn't you ask for something specific? Well, I'm, the Commonwealth's position is not that we should be allowed to pick and choose. The Commonwealth's position is that in this finite number of retrospective cases, where, P, where we routinely requested, say, two weeks of CSLI, which I would maintain is a reasonable request given that defendants constantly, uh, when they're committing joint venture crimes, will discuss in advance how to plan those crimes, will talk after the crime about how to dispose of evidence, how to sink their alibis, et cetera. But notwithstanding that fact, 
in this finite number of cases where we know exactly when the crime occurred, the most reasonable time frame to apply the six-hour window severance to, or whatever that window ultimately comes out to be, is the time immediately surrounding the crime. And I'm saying in every case, that should be the time. What, what, what support, what case supports that logic? Let. I don't think Principles so. of severance are routinely applied to overbroad warrants. And that principle applies here. When you're there talking about a search warrant. There's probable cause in a search warrant. But it's a different situation. In search, you're correct. In a search warrant situation, let's say I want to search a house. You'll always need probable cause to search a house, regardless of what you're looking for. So if we have probable cause to search for some things in the house, but not other things, we excise those things. But you have no probable cause here at all. But we... But for a certain period of time, we don't need probable cause because when you get down to, let's say, for example, as this court said in Augustine, a six-hour window, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. But that's not what Augustine said. Well, but, well, I understand it did not hold that, but it suggested that a request for six hours of CSLI would hours. not this intrude. This wasn't a request for six hours. This is hours. before Augustine, right? This is two years before Augustine. Augustine was before Augustine, too. All right. Uh, it can't, suppression of CSLI, to, to address the separate exclusionary rule argument, just because I don't believe this court actually addressed the exclusionary rule in Augustine. Um, suppression of CSLI information that is obtained pursuant to a lawful court order issued by a superior court judge based on a showing by law enforcement that met the requirements of the governing federal statute. Um, a statute that a statute that has been called into question that wasn't at the time called into question by this court or the United States Supreme Court does not in any way serve the purposes of the exclusionary rule. Officers elicited voluntary statements from both of these defendants and while they objectively reasonably relied on this order that this court two years later determined was based on a standard that they could no longer abide. How does that in any way deter unlawful conduct? It doesn't. It only puts the Commonwealth in a worse position than it would have occupied had it not relied on the constitutionality of that statute. And so there was no deterrent effect in this retrospective case where we got it two years before this court determined. Are suggesting August. that's what Judge Tutman found? I'm suggesting, no. I'm, Judge Tutman found that the exclusionary rule would not, would uh, be satisfied by severing everything outside of the six-hour window. I am, I am content if that court, if this court agrees with that holding. I am saying that it's the Commonwealth's position that application of the exclusionary rule to any of this makes no sense whatsoever because there is no deterrent effect. The, uh, the uh, Commonwealth and the police objectively, reasonably relied on what was a valid statute. Well, if, if that was the case, why would we send back Augustine? I, I can't, I'm, I'm telling, it is the Commonwealth's position that this court just did not engage in an exclusionary rule analysis. I see that there is an exclusionary rule section in the brief, but this court almost immediately says, oh, well, the Commonwealth contends there was probable cause, so let's go find out if there was probable cause. There really was not any analysis of the principles of the exclusionary rule in Augustine. And this court has held, um, or at least Massachusetts, while not acknowledging the good faith exception, has recognized, for example, that when officers objectively and reasonably rely on the act of another government body, for example, uh, I would just cite to Miller, which is a Mass Appeals Court case, 78 Mass Appeals Court at uh, 864, 865, and the actions of that governing body are later determined to be incorrect or invalid, evidence obtained by otherwise proper police action doesn't need to be suppressed. I believe in Miller there was reliance on an RMV regulation uh, that was later determined to contradict, uh, 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 to be in con. Uh, at odds with a Massachusetts statute. But here, we, the, the Commonwealth relied on a federal statute that had not, that no one had called into question, not this court, not the United States Supreme Court. They met the standard required by that federal statute, not probable cause, but uh, relevant and material to an ongoing investigation. And I think at the very <coughs> least, acknowledging that what just Judge Tutman acknowledged, which is that if you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a short period of CSLI, which you likely don't because it doesn't show your habits and your proclivities. It's not going to show that you're visiting a mosque once a week or that you're cheating on your you husband six, or your wife. Did you get two weeks' worth of information? We did. Yes. So yes. you did have much longer than six hours of surveillance. That's right. And I'm suggesting that you can sever, you can apply in this, in all retrospective cases, you can say, we know what time the crime happened. You get X number of hours on either side of the crime, and we're severing everything else. Can't use it, right? 
severing everything else, in other words, nothing else is usable directly or indirectly. Is that your position? Beyond that six-hour window. Beyond whatever window was ultimately determined right. to be the appropriate window. The judge However, here, said the six hour here window. we can use it all because we subsequently applied for a warrant that was supported by ample independent probable cause. So tell me what the, uh, on that, um, Mr. Beck says actually the, the CSLI tainted a whole lot more than what Judge Tutman uh, found. What was, what was the evidence put before her on which she made the findings that there was all this independent? Absolutely, um, and I see um, my time is running short, so I'd ask leave of the court. I believe I'll probably go uh, okay. beyond. Uh, first and foremost, evidence that was before her before any CSLI was requested. The victim's brother, Ryan Kohler, had provided vague uh, descriptions of the suspects. Nick Capello, who was the roommate of Quentin Kohler and who was learned to have been dealing marijuana out of the house, tells investigators within the first 24 hours, I used to buy marijuana from Ashley Marshall. I find it very odd that after severing ties with her two months ago, she out of the blue contacted me the day the evening before this crime occurred and asked if I wanted to buy marijuana. She never contacts me. I always contact her. We had had no contact. The reason I'd stopped dealing with her is because this muscly thug guy, Adam Bradley, uh, was uh, at the last buy and I didn't want to deal with that guy. So the uh, police look into Adam Bradley. They find out that he has a lengthy criminal record involving guns, firearms, and drugs. Uh, and they get a subpoena, administrative subpoena, for Ashley Marshall's cell phone and his cell phone. They see that those two are in contact constantly, I believe it's at least 10 times in the hours leading up to the crime. They also see that Adam Bradley is talking to phones who are, which are subsequently determined to belong to Peter Bin, Stephen Touch, Sofen Keo, and Gabriel Arias. Administrative subpoenas for the Bin and Touch phones are also obtained prior to the date that CSLI was requested. The Commonwealth also knows prior to July 25th, the two white cars are seen traveling in surveillance footage from a 7-Eleven side by side, coming to the scene and leaving the scene afterwards. So all of that is known before we even apply for CSLI. After the CSLI is obtained, the Commonwealth follows up on those two cars. They find out that they're registered to touch his girlfriend and to Keo, that Keo's car was checked by a police officer in Burlington an hour before the crime, or in Bill Ricca, excuse me. They find uh, that um, DNA, which was found at the scene on the night or and in the following morning and sent to the lab via the testimony at the hearing prior to the CSLI request, comes back and shows that Bradley's DNA is on a glove found in close proximity to the scene in addition to gunshot residue on that glove, that Bin's DNA is on a hat found just outside the door of the kitchen. So they have that DNA evidence. They also have the uh, grand jury testimony of Ashley Marshall. Whatever extent Mr. Beck feels Ms. Marshall's rights are violated, he has absolutely no standing to contest the violation of those rights. Ashley Marshall tells the grand jury, Bradley came to me the night before the homicide and said, I am looking for some money and I want to find a guy to rob. Who can I rob? And she says, go rob Nick Capello. I mean, I can go on. There's more. But that is more than adequate probable cause for a search warrant. And because there was sufficient independent source, or independent information supporting that warrant, separate and apart, not only from the CSLI, but from a lot of these statements, which I don't have time to tell you are not a product of the CSLI, but which we argue in our brief are. For those reasons, all of this information was admissible, uh, and Justice Tutman correctly including, denied the motion. Including the defendant's statements, because I thought I heard the defendant argue that even if you could get the CSLI, his statements were still... He does argue. Well, there are two, so I'll try to be very brief with this. With regards to Estabrook, with regards to Bradley's statements, his statement in the first interview that is most relevant is the fact that he mentions Jason Estabrook and turns law enforcement on to Jason Estabrook. If you look at the Commonwealth's brief and you read the interview, he offers up Jason Estabrook prior to any confrontation with CSLI. Officers are asking him about his call logs, which they had via administrative subpoena, and he offers them up. Estabrook then, in a second interview with authorities prior to his grand jury testimony, which unfortunately was unrecorded, offers up without any mention of CSLI, that is the testimony at the motion to suppress of Roy Frost that was not challenged, that he was in a fight and he went to the hospital. They go there, they get his hospital records. He admits getting hit with a tea kettle, which is consistent with Ryan Kohler's statement. He's wearing clothes in the surveillance video that are consistent with an assailant. He is then in his final interview confronted with that and Bradley's mention that he was a guy who was possibly involved and not his CSLI. 
So all of Estabrook's statements the Commonwealth would submit come in. As to Bradley's, I would suggest you can look at his second interview and determine what and what doesn't, what doesn't, does not. Bradley does not admit any involvement in his final interview. He only says, well, Estabrook told me that all these other guys were involved and that such and such happened. So there's no admissions by Bradley that he did anything in his uh, uh, final interview. He just throws everyone else under the bus. Uh, so I hope, I hope that has sufficiently answered Your Honor's question. Thank you. Uh, All right, thank you. Thank you for the extra time, and I'll, the Commonwealth will rest.